Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about how Biden made Russia great again, okay? Uh, now, it's not just Biden because Biden doesn't know whether he's coming or going. It's really how the Democrats made Russia great again with the help of Republicans, okay? Uh, but no question that Russia is in a much better position uh, post sanctions, right? Post those sanctions that the United States put on them than they were before, okay? And we're going to talk about why here. Uh, now, I get my news from multiple sources, okay? Some pro Russian, some anti Russian, some pro Ukrainian, some anti Ukrainian. Um, so, a lot of it is like trying to look through the bullshit, okay? Look through the propaganda, uh, trying to um, um, get, you know, some type of uh, cooperation from other sources, okay? Um, so, so yeah, it, it looks to me, all the evidence is pointing in the direction uh, that Russia is very much winning this war in Ukraine and, and coming out much better, for it, okay. Uh, now, with regards to winning, I mean, I don't think that it's necessarily Russia's goal to like um, to occupy all of Ukraine. Uh, I think that they're more interested in occupying a certain certain parts of Ukraine, uh, creating a buffer zone, uh, and and uh, more than anything, uh, demilitarizing Ukraine. Uh, and it seems like the strategy that they're using is to basically just get them to use up as much of their weapons as possible. So they're sending out $500 drones and having Ukraine shoot like million dollar U.S. supplied missiles at these $500 drones. And they just keep sending out more and more. Uh, the ground tactics seem to be like the Russians using very small units. So rather than trying to, you know, like have a gigantic army march across Ukraine, they're, they're using small units in a provocative type of manner, you know, trying to get the Ukrainian army to expose itself, to expo expose uh, where their bases are, where their supply depots are, and then Russia seems to be hitting the supply depots, okay? Um, so, so, so that's what it looks like, okay? So um, let me say this, uh, I have... Because I grew up in New York City, and you know, there's obviously lots of uh, people from around the world in New York City. I have gotten to know many Russians, and I have gotten to know many Ukrainians uh, over the years. Okay, I went to Brooklyn College, and in Brooklyn, when I was in Brooklyn College, it's like if I was this is back in the, in the early '90s when you when I was walking across the campus, it seemed like I kept hearing "voshki voshki 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 voshki" from all the you know, that's not all the Russians and Ukrainians. That's that's the sound that they make when they talk. Vushka, vashka, vushka, vashka, vashka, vashka. So, so that's that's the sound I got used to. So uh, let me say this. Uh, when you look at like Russians and Ukrainians, they look the same. They sound the same. Their manners are very much the same. Uh, so there's no difference between them other than the politics. Okay. Um, you know, so, so you know, now I'm going to say this. Um uh, you know, when I when you talk to them and you you know, it seems that they they are more like Americans than certainly like all the people coming across the southern border. OK, you know, those those people coming across the southern border, very different culture, very different. You know, uh, I mean, they're just very different. OK, um, you know, Russians, Ukrainians, they're practically Europeans. I mean, they I mean, they are very American like. Uh, the one big difference that I saw in Russians and Ukrainians is they smoke like chimneys, man. Especially the girls. They just sit there and they're like, poof, 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 all day. I mean, they just smoke. Like, you can't stand next to them because of the stench of, 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 of uh, tobacco that comes off of them, okay? So that's one of the things I'm going to say about, you know, Russians. That's the thing that makes them the most different, I think. The amount of smoking that they do, okay? And that's the most annoying thing that I found about them, okay? But 
other than that, they're very American-like, okay? Um, their, their, their logic, the way they think, it's, it's very American-like, okay? So, uh, so anyway, let's, let's talk. now this was back in the 90s. I think this was like full of Gorbachev, you know, comes down. Uh, Boris Yeltsin's in power. The CIA, United States, is doing everything that they can to weaken Russia, okay? Um, and then a lot, at some point along comes uh, Putin, and, you know, he's basically with the goal of trying to make Russia, uh, you know, a, a nation again, right? So that way, now, the goal, the goal of, uh, not the goal, the deal, the deal that Gorbachev made with Reagan was that he would allow for reunification of Germany uh, if NATO would not expand, okay? And NATO has broken that promise. They have since added... 14 ex Warsaw Pact countries uh, into NATO, and basically they were trying to now get Ukraine in there. And I think, you know, this is the point where Russia's like, no way, you guys aren't doing this enough, okay? And, and it's not like they didn't, they, they wouldn't, if they could have, they would have stopped the other 14 from joining NATO, but at the time they were just too weak. Um, so it seems like, you know, as Russia has gone back on its feet, you know, they're now at the point where like, hey, you know that thing that you were doing, like, you know, over the last 15 years, you're not doing that anymore. OK, over the last 20 or so years, that's got to stop. You're not putting Ukraine in NATO. You're not putting, you know, missiles in Ukraine pointed at Russia. OK, so what, what I want to talk about, let's get back on topic here. I, I kind of wanted to give you guys the, the, the background. Um, how has Biden Democrats made Russia great again, okay? So uh, the number one thing was the sanctions. I mean, that was the thing that I think made Russia great again because the first thing that the sanctions did is uh, it, it cut off like US dollars, US business, or not just yours, I mean like European um, you know, G7 business going into Russia. And the oligarchs, where I have oligarchs, up here, the oligarchs, Right, you had you had a small group of oligarchs in Russia that were like greatly benefiting off of this, right? And um, Putin was kind of like almost like sharing power with these people, okay? Because they were there when he got there, and as he you know as he came up through the ranks, they actually most likely from what I've heard they helped get him in power. Um, so so he, he couldn't just like just throw these guys out because they were just like so well entrenched, but the the sanctions cut off the the money flow to these oligarchs, uh, weakened them, right? And he was able to, you know, basically, uh, um, you know, uh, kind of dominate them, basically, right? He was able. Some of them, I heard, he got rid of some of them, killed a few, you know, killed some of them, whatever. But it seems like these sanctions helped. The news I'm hearing is that these sanctions helped Putin deal with the oligarchs, right? And it took power away from them. So these sanctions helped him uh, gain more control of his country, okay? Um, now, the next thing, and this is probably the bigger thing, the more important thing that these sanctions did um, is they pushed more of the world into this BRICS agreement, right? And, I, and I've, I've been doing a little research into BRICS because uh, you have like the G7 countries, right? Which is the United States... England, Canada, a bunch of its allies. And then you have an alternative economic group called BRICS. Um, the, the, the main countries are Brazil, Russia, India, China. Uh, and I think this thing started back like in 1995. And I think around 2000 started gaining a little bit, gaining a little bit more strength. Um, and um, now I think there's like some 40 plus countries that either have membership with BRICS or are trying to get membership with BRICS, okay? And I think France was actually rejected. France was trying to get into BRICS and they said, no, we don't want you, okay? Um, so, and that says a lot, you know, that says a lot about their position because France is a fairly large country, but they, they rejected it. So that tells me that, you know, these guys are, are doing pretty good over here, okay? So, uh, Part of the goal of BRICS here is to 
you know, um, they're trying to, they haven't done it yet, but they're trying to form an alternative worldwide currency to the U.S. dollar, okay, um, and also an alternative uh, money payment system, because right now we use the SWIFT payment system, which again is U.S. controlled, and the United States basically tried to lock Russia out of SWIFT. So again, this put Russia in, in a position where it's like, okay, we got to do something else. So Russia being part of BRICS, and, and they're also the, this year in 2024, I believe that, that Russian is like the chair country. They're, they're like kind of, I think they take turns in, in terms of which country is going to lead BRICS. So this is Russia's year to lead BRICS, okay? Um, so Russia's really pushing for an alternative currency and an alternative monetary payment system, okay? So... So this this all happened, right? The, the, you know, this this new this push happened as a result of the United States not only sanctioning uh, Russia, but also freezing its mount its assets, right? I think like billions of dollars, something like three hundred billion dollars or something, freezing its assets, preventing Russia uh, from paying debt, right? Around because they owe other countries around the world debt. Um, so 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 it it froze. Uh, Russia's assets and a lot of the world looked at this and they said wait a second you, I mean I, I mean how are you just freezing their assets and now that the United States is actually talking about confiscating or taking which is basically stealing they want to steal Russia's money and and give it to Ukraine okay they want to just unilaterally make that decision right take take this money that belongs to Russia uh, give it to Ukraine or do whatever they want to do with it I mean you know the point is they're taking away Russia's money, okay? Um, so a, a lot of countries around the world are looking at this and they're like, wait a second, if the United States can do this to Russia, which is a big country, imagine what they can do to little old us, okay? So a lot of the countries around the world are not feeling very comfortable right now with both the U.S. dollar being the dominant monetary system and also this swift payment system that the United States apparently can just like snap its fingers and cut people out from. So there's a big push. Now, when we look at, uh, I was looking at the BRICS countries versus the G7 countries. Um, I think the, the, uh, the, the BRICS has the BRICS countries. And I think not just these uh, five countries in the, 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 the first five countries, but also the other additional countries that have joined BRICS. Um, the, the G7 countries are like 30% of the world's GDP, right? Gross domestic product. They, they control like 30% of the world's GDP. The BRICS countries now have 32% of the world's GDP. So, so BRICS is actually larger than the G7 countries, okay? Now, the issue with these guys is they still, they're talking about establishing some international uh, payment system. Like right now, like China and Russia each had their own but the, the key is like getting other countries to basically agree to decide to use one of these payment systems and of course trying to get a common currency because whatever the, the common currency is like whoever controls the currency basically gets to print money right like the united states they get to print as much money as they want without consequence right well there is some consequence there's the consequence of inflation and there's the consequence of other countries not being happy with United States printing as much money as they want. Now, printing money is a, a real important issue here because that's how the United States taxes the world, okay? United States, in fact, the United States gets most of its tax money around from the rest of the world. That's probably a very small part of what they collect from inside the United States because, you know, anytime the government prints up money, right, they dilute the value of the existing money. So anytime the government decreases the buying power of your money, okay, uh, what they're doing is they're taxing, okay? So, so the government, in the United States, the government taxes us through direct taxation, but then they also tax us through, through uh, inflation, right? They, they print up the money, dilute our existing money. Well, they do this around the world, right? And that's the reason why the United States can have like 20 aircraft carriers, right? Where nobody else in the world can have that many aircraft carriers because the United States is taxing the world and the rest of the world is not stupid. They realize that they are being taxed uh, heavily uh, through 
inflation and money dilution. So again, this is putting a lot of pressure and you know, giving a lot of countries around the world incentive to get away from the U.S. dollar, okay, and, and, and go to some alternative currency. So Biden has done something here in the, in the last, like, what, three years, like since, since 20, whenever he got in, 2021, I mean, he's done, he's done uh, so much damage to the United States globally that it's like, it was, it's almost like unimaginable the amount of damage he has done. I mean, number one, he's let all these people through the southern border. So now you got all these people that are coming into the country that are expecting welfare, right? That are not going to be contributing everything. Um, you know, so, so that's, and you, how are you going to get rid of them? You know, I mean, I mean, any, you know, any, any way that you try to round them up and throw them back over the border, I mean, you're going to have people saying, you know, calling, screaming Nazis, concentration camps, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but I mean, that's essentially what you got to do. You got to round them up, you know, tie them up and just throw them back over the border and basically put a, a, a minefield across the southern border to keep them from coming back. OK, um, I mean, that's that's what what Biden has done by opening the southern border. So that's one thing. But what he's done here internationally uh, to this, to the United States, to the U.S. dollar, to the status of the of of the uh, of the dollar around the world is like that's 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 you can't fix that. I mean, that's just so much damage. And and that's and this happened within like the course of a month when the United States decided that they were going to uh, to to put to freeze Russia's assets, basically take their money. Okay. Um, I mean, I got to tell you, guys, I don't even feel comfortable with that because. I mean, I, I hate the idea that the United States can basically, you know, go into my bank account, right? You know, basically, you know, trump up some some phony charges on me, come up with a conviction in one of their kangaroo courts, right? Come up with this gigantic fine, right? And then you just go into my bank accounts and just take my money because the, the government can do that, okay? So this, what the United States has been doing, just confiscating whatever it wants, makes me feel very uncomfortable. It's like, I want to be part of this BRICS system too. Like, I want to have a bank account in one of those other countries, you know, that the United States government cannot get to, okay? Um, and, and now, right now, the way it works is if you have a bank account, a foreign bank account, you, they, you, you have to report that on your tax return and you have to do like an annual report that tells the U.S. government that you have this foreign uh, bank account. And the way that they got this done is they were saying, oh, this is part of the war on drugs. So they were, apparently they were trying to stop, uh, you know, drug trafficking around the world. Yeah. Well, anything that the government tries to, eventually it, it works against U.S. citizens. Okay. So what, what they said was just like the Unpatriot Act, right? They said that they were just going to wiretap and record terrorists. Well, now they're wiretapping and recording every single phone call, right? Every, every, every phone call, every text message that we send out is recorded. And then all they got to do is get some phony judge to sign an order down the road. And then they can go back and listen to that, to that, uh, that recording. Okay. So everything is being recorded. That's that goes through any electronics, including this video right here. Okay. Um, so, so I do not feel comfortable with the fact that the United States can just go into my bank account, take whatever. And I was starting to say, like, if you have a bank, foreign bank account, you have to report it to the U.S. government. But here's the thing. If you don't, right, if you don't and you're big enough fish, they can get that information anyway because they can put pressure on these foreign governments and these foreign banks that are really not independent. They're not that powerful, not strong. And say, hey, if you don't give us this information... We're going to sanction you. We're going to penalize you. We're going to take money from you. So, so foreign, you know, banks around the world that run on U.S. dollars and are part of this swift payment system, they have a very big incentive to cooperate uh, with the U.S. government. So uh, this brick system, right, that is completely independent, seems like a really good alternative that I think even the, you know, the common American citizen might be interested in, okay? You know, if they're not going to cooperate with the U.S. government, you know, maybe I want to talk to them, right? I want to talk with the competition, all right? So, um, so yeah, so anyway, so, so and, and this all happened, like, it was there before, but now it's like, all of a sudden, like, the, the world saw that, hey, the U.S. government is just taking money whenever it feels like taking money because they don't like what you're doing, and, and the world is looking for an alternative, okay? So, this is how... Biden made 
Russia, this is how Biden made BRICS great, okay? Um, so, um, so where is the United States going to be left? Because what's going to happen is as more and more of the world goes into this, into some alternative cult, uh, currency, the U.S. dollars are going to be like, okay, we don't need these U.S. dollars anymore. So the U.S. dollars and there's like more money outside the United States and inside the United States is going to become more and more worthless. So at some point, if this really goes into effect, this BRICS alternative money system, the U.S. dollar is going to be worth nothing. Okay, And when I say nothing, I mean, people don't understand. You know, when the United States prints, prints up a, a trillion dollars, that's a big number, man. I think like there's like seven trillion grains of sand on the entire earth. So when the United States prints up a trillion dollars, they're printing up a lot of money, okay? Now, they're not actually printing it. It's an, it's, they're, they're printing it electronically on a computer because there's not enough paper in the universe to print the trillion dollars. But uh, one of the things I tell people is like a million seconds is seven days. A billion seconds is 31 years. A trillion seconds is 31,000 years, okay? So when the United States says that they're $40 trillion in debt, that's a lot of money they printed up because there's no place in the universe where they could possibly borrow that money, okay? Nobody has a trillion dollars to, to, to lend to the United States. So it's just, it's purely printed money, okay? Now, I've done separate videos on how money is supposed to be created in the fiat system. Um, it is a Ponzi scheme, but it's supposed to be like a controlled Ponzi scheme where um, when you, you know, if you get a mortgage on your house, or you know, or you, or, or let's say you go to, to finance a car, or if you have a gold mine, right, and you and you bring the gold to the bank, or you bring your car, your house to the, the deed to your car, your or, or your house to the bank, the bank takes that asset and they use that asset to create new money. Okay, this happens locally. Okay, banks have the ability to create money. We have an asset-backed system. All right, You're supposed to put up a real asset, and the bank creates money based on that asset. Hey everyone, I want to cut in here real quick. Uh, I failed to explain that when the bank creates money based on an asset that you've put up, they do not create the interest. Okay, so if you borrow $200,000 for your house, right, bank creates $200,000, but you got to pay back $300,000, which includes the interest. So the bank never created that money. So what happens is the current generation of borrowers uh, depends on the next generation of borrowers to come in, borrow money, so that more money will be in the system so that you can pay back the interest that you own. Well, the problem here is that the government doesn't play by the same rules, okay? The government puts up debt, okay? So they don't have to put up a real asset. They just give themselves an IOU, okay? And poof, they create money to the tune of like $40 trillion, so everybody around the world that knows money understands this. And they're like, I mean, these guys are like out of control with the, with the money printing. We need an alternative. Okay. So um, what's going to happen is as the world moves away from, from, uh, uh, from U.S. dollars, and, and especially the oil producing companies, uh, countries like Saudi Arabia, United Emirates, those guys, they absolutely are desperate to get away from U.S. dollars. And if, if the petrodollar falls, the U.S. dollar is Garbage, man. Nobody's ever going to want U.S. dollars again. Even Americans aren't going to want U.S. dollars. Um, so, so this is creating what I think is a very desperate situation for the U.S. government. Okay, so, so, so U.S. government is seeing this, and they're basically seeing that they're almost like, like at a point of collapsing, right? Because you got this Ponzi scheme money system that's about to collapse. Everybody's moving away from the dollars. So the United States is like, okay, what, what are we going to do? How are we going to deal with this? We're about to like be dethroned as the world's super, the world's, as the world's superpower. So if the dollar goes, what does the United States have left? Well, they got a military that is bigger and more powerful uh, than all the militaries of the world combined. Okay, that's what they've been doing with this money they've been printing up. Now, don't kid yourself. I mean, yes, I mean, Russia is more than capable of defending its borders, right, and, 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 and projecting its power along its borders, okay? But it's another thing to be able to project power all the way around the world, okay? That's, that's a whole other thing. So the so United States has this, uh, this gigantic military, right? And if the U.S. dollar goes, right, which right now the most powerful weapon of the U.S. government is the dollar. That's the, that's the, that's the weapon that they use to control the world. If the U.S. dollar goes and they no longer have that weapon, what are they going to do? They're going to resort to their next best weapon, which is the, the U.S. military itself. 
So my thought on this is I, I see the U.S., the United States becoming uh, very hostile, like even more hostile than they've ever been if the U.S. dollar falls. Because now it's like, you know, now, now it's like almost like a do or die type of situation. Like how do they, how do they protect their empire, okay? I see them like like desperately provoking war, wars. Okay, now this war in Ukraine was absolutely provoked. I think that they they instill they instilled uh, installed uh, Zelensky, right? I mean, you know, they basically however they did it, they uh, you know they faked an election, uh, bought people, uh, you know, um, bought you know bribed the vote counters. Yeah, they installed Zelensky for the purpose of uh, starting a war with Russia because the United States had this grand plan that they were going to sanction Russia and bankrupt them, which has like blown up in their face. It's completely backfired. And as a result of those sanction sanctions, the United States, I'm sorry, Russia has come out stronger than it has ever been, probably even stronger than, than it was as the Soviet Union. It's probably come out in a much stronger position, right? It's got alliances, strong alliances with China, you know, Brazil, India, you know, um, you know, South America. So they've, they've, I mean, they've really stretched out their alliances over here. Um, so, so yeah, the United States, I think, is in a really, has put themselves in a really bad position here. And it's good. I mean, I, I mean, I don't see a way for them to get out of this. I mean, there's one of those things like you can't go back to where you were before, right? You can't go back to 2020. Okay. In 2020, all right the American people had a choice, okay? Um, and, you know, I mean, fine, even if there was some cheating, election cheating, hey, at least 40% of Americans, maybe 40, at least 45% of Americans decided that they cared more about welfare, uh, killing babies, uh, you know, their government jobs, okay? At least 45% of Americans, and they voted for Biden, okay? And this is the result, okay? This is the result, and you can't go back. Okay? Even if, let's say Trump is, is elected in 20, you know this year in uh, 2024, he's you know it's it's not like he's going to go back into the White House and pick up where he left off. What he's getting now and what what he would be getting in 2025 is very different than what he left in 20 in 2020, 2021 right January 2021. It's going to be very different. He, you can't go back to where you were before. The United States and the world has changed, okay? And, and that's how Biden made Russia great again.